Well, after that twist, Sherlock has proved it has all but jumped the shark in one of its most shocking and darkest episodes yet. Hey guys, Cameron for Sherlock, Series 4, Episode 2, The Lying Detective, and I was definitely hyped for this episode. I know a lot of people weren't a huge fan of uh, last week's episode, and I was honestly kind of surprised, honestly. Well, I wouldn't say it was exactly surprised, more that I was just a little bit baffled at how many people were dropping out of this show, and how many people were wait ready to quit Sherlock after one episode. I mean... If it was a standard, run-of-the-mill, like, uh, network-type TV show that really wasn't that great, that I can understand. But with a show like Sherlock, who just has such a big fan base and, you know, is one of the most expertly crafted uh, shows of its kind on TV, and it's just such great British TV, I really don't understand how one episode would just get you to drop out. But if you did, hopefully this episode got you on board, because damn was this a good episode. I mean, this was ten times better than last week's. Not that I didn't like last week's episode. I love last week's episode. I'm one of the few people who did. I feel like I'm in the minority for last week's episode, but I thought this episode was even better. We focused on this really compelling case in this episode. There was also some great uh, uh, psychological stuff here. Also some great character work, just some great performances. Just really everything you want in a perfect Sherlock episode. This episode really did have one of the best episodes I think in the show so far, but there's so much to talk about. Let's just get into it. More than last week, definitely. Last week was definitely more of a... I wouldn't say a catch-up episode, but it was definitely more of an exposition-heavy episode, and this episode was anything but that. So let's just get right into it. So we start off with John, and this is a big episode for John. Like, as much as Sherlock is a part of this episode, I think John really is the real hero and main character of this episode, definitely. So he's talking to his therapist, which is a completely different one. It's not the one that we've been getting brief glimpses of over the previous three seasons. It's also not Sherlock's new therapist who he was talking to in the last episode. It's actually a different therapist and he needs all the help he can get because he's not handling Mary's death well at all. He doesn't sleep or wake so much as lie down and get back up. Um, baby Rosie spending most of her time with friends, but of course not Sherlock as we know. He, you know, Molly explained that to him at the end of last week's episode. But the most important thing though is that he is still seeing visions of uh, Mary. He's still talking to her. And, you know, she is a figment of his, uh, he, uh, he, she is a figment of his imagination, and I thought this was a good way of keeping her onto the show. I was a little bit surprised that Amanda Abington was, in fact, kept on, because we know all the problems that Martin Freeman and Amanda Abington have been having offset. You know, if you guys know, one of the reasons that she left the show is because these two were married, and I guess they had a really bad divorce, but... I do like the fact that he still thinks she's a great actress, and it really does show that Martin Freeman very well prioritizes his career over his relationship, and that is definitely the same when it comes to past relationships. He will still work with them, and... I was happy to see that, and I really did love Amanda Abington. I think she's a very good actress, so I was happy to see her still here, but she follows him everywhere despite her own insistence that he acknowledges her very uh, death, and the fact that she doesn't think that she's dead is very, very interesting because a lot of people didn't think that Mary was actually dead when, in fact, of course, we know she was, but I thought this was a really good way of setting up, uh, you know, what was really going on with John overall, um... And I thought definitely adding Mary to it definitely added to the whole John kind of regretting what's going on. Him clearly, you know, kind of not wanting to believe it, but knowing that it's true. I thought that was interesting. And John says that no one turned from Sherlock. The detective is apparently confining himself to his law. Perhaps that's because Sherlock's only friend in the world told me he'd rather talk to anyone but him, as we know. So, obviously, this is very much scarred Sherlock. I mean, Sherlock, uh, probably, you know, has probably locked himself away, obviously, you know, he just killed his best, for his former best friend's, uh, wife, so, or at least his, his best friend blames him for that, so obviously, it is probably gonna fuck him up a bit, and, uh, John says that Sherlock isn't trying to get in contact with him, because if he was, people would notice, because, you know, people would know if that was happening, you know, Sherlock's so popular that someone would have had to notice, and, Right on cue, there's a common, there's a commotion outside. John is there with them right out to find fancy sports cars being pursued hotly by the police. There's this helicopter hovering threateningly overhead. We don't know what's going on there, but such a great way to start the episode. This was a really great way of catching us up to what John has been doing. Because you definitely can tell it's a, some time has definitely passed since the last episode, but... 
I did like the way that we really got to see how John's been dealing with this or how he's really been trying to cope with everything that's been going on. A very good setup overall that very well sets us up into what this overall episode is going to be like. So then we get introduced to one of the most hyped up villains, I think, since Moriarty, honestly, and that being Culverton Smith, played by Toby Jones, and what a great role this was. I mean, Toby Jones, we knew, was going to be on the show for a very long time, but they tried to keep his role as secret as possible, and this episode can definitely tell you why. I mean, this is by far one of the most menacing villains we have had on the show. Uh, from the moment we see him, I mean, we just have this really creepy demeanor from him. You can just tell that there's something off about this guy. You don't know what it is, but something about him just doesn't really hit us right. And there are quick hits of him appearing on the news. Then there's a full-on scene of him. They did a really good job of setting him up, because as we know... Last week's episode, we just got, like, a newspaper article. In this episode, we actually get to see him. You know, he is the focus of most of this episode. So, there's a full scene of him talking to a group of close associates gathered around a conference table, and he's got something on his mind, and he wants to confess it to these people, but in his opinion, revealing a daring secret is the worst thing you can do to a friend. Now, keep that in mind, because that is definitely the major theme of this episode, is secrets. Secrets being revealed, you know, should you keep these secrets hidden, or should you reveal them? That is definitely, I think, the major theme of this entire episode, or even the season, I'd say, and if they don't accept it, you can't uh, unsay it, which is true, because, and I definitely think that Culverton does have a point there, because if they don't think you're telling the truth, you know, you can't say, oh, I never told you that. So his solution is to infuse everyone around the table with a special drug so they'll forget whatever he says almost immediately, and everyone seems to agree to this, even Culverton's daughter Faith, though she seems understandably creeped out, which is understandable. I mean, he, again, very creepy stuff, and Toby Jones absolutely kills it as this character. Like, as creepy as he was, he was just giving such great performance throughout the whole episode, and later a drugged out Faith tries to remember what her father said. All she knows is he said he had a problem, one he could only solve by killing someone. And he doesn't specify who he wants to kill, he just says that I want to kill anyone. And that doesn't mean that he's going to kill one individual, he could kill a mass murder, it could be really anything. And that uh, line very well drives the creepiness of this character. I mean, just knowing that this character wants to kill, and that he has this you know, passion to kill. This isn't something where he's killing for any specific reason. No, he just enjoys wanting to kill. And that very much, I mean, that's very scary to think about, that this guy is out there and he could kill any one of our characters. And I thought he did a really good job of saying this up. We realized this was three years ago, and in the present, Faith visits Sherlock's loft to tell him the story and beg for his help. And I really did love the way this was set up, because at this point, Sherlock wants nothing to do with, uh, you know, the crime life. You know, he really wants to be turned away from it. He's taken Mary's death even worse than John. He's now living with a nameless junkie in a kitchen that looks a bit too much like a meth lab, and he's also, uh, really not Sherlock at all. He's making deductions, but his brain moves faster than he does at the moment, and he can't quite keep up with it. Nevertheless, he does still find a connection with Faith when he realizes he really is her only last hope, because she's doing whatever she can to try to get away from her father and try to rescue her from what's going on because I think you know Faith is the one that's terrified that she's going to be that next victim you know Faith was in that room she agreed to what the father said so she's just as creeped out as everyone else is and she talks about how she's feeling suicidal and might just disappear into the night rain and Basically, Sherlock decides to take Faith on a nighttime stroll to discuss the case further, and one of the best parts of this episode are the scenes between Sherlock and Faith. I thought they just had a really good chemistry throughout the whole episode. They set them up very well, but we see Mycroft dispatches the drone to track them, so Sherlock takes a route that spells fuck off to the UI, uh, basically, because he knows that Mycroft is watching, so that was pretty funny. There definitely was some good humor here, which I did like. I like that even though this was a dark episode, there was definitely humor in there, and I think that's something that Sherlock has always done very well, and this episode, no exception. Mycroft then calls John for help, but, but uh, John's a little bit tired of everything being about Sherlock all the time, even in the midst of other people's tragedies, and he sarcastically uh, comments Mycroft and his ability to hijack the machinery of the state to look after his own family. Of course, that being... Um, you know, what what had to do with Sherlock and everything, with the promise he made, and before, before hanging out to reclaim whatever sleep is available to him these days, and back at base, Mycroft talks with Lady Smallwood, who asks him about the mysterious third home sibling, to whom Mycroft keeps mysteriously alluding to. Now, this is very important once we get to the final moments of this episode, we're gonna talk about that, I know you guys want me to get into that, but don't worry, I will definitely get into that very soon, but... 
Mycroft says he gets regular updates about Sharon Ford, and the third Holmes is secure, whatever that means. Now, we keep getting hints of this Sharon Ford, but still, out of this episode, we don't exactly know what Sharon Ford is. We just know that there's something that says, call Sharon Ford at 2 o'clock. So we don't know if Sharon Ford's a person, if it's a place. We don't really know what that's all about, so that's something that we still are very unclear about. And I like the way the, the show is still keeping some of those things open. You know, it keeps us, it gives us something to look forward to in the third episode, and they're doing that very well. So Sherlock's very interested in Faith's case because she says that her father uttered one word that changed her life, the name of the person he was going to kill, which she's desperately trying to remember, but unfortunately, that is not coming to her. So most names aren't just one word, so what did Culverton really say? That's what has Sherlock's attention, is who did he really plan on killing, because he didn't really give her one specific name. So for payment, he demands the gun that Faith was hiding in her handbag, which he proceeds to throw over a bridge, and Sherlock now says that thinking about suicide as a selfless act is exactly backward. Your death is something that happens to everybody else, and you can tell the constant on this episode, he gets fixated on this case, and I like seeing Sherlock, you know, fixate on something where he's constantly trying to think about what to do about this case, but constantly through this episode, he's also taken aback by tons of drug-infused memories in his head, and he can't really control them because of the drugs he's on, and, and while that could be very annoying, I thought it made sense for Sherlock because the tragedy he's gone through and everything that's happened to him, this is not the same Sherlock that we come to know, and I think they very well make that apparent throughout this entire episode. To uh, Faith, he does start tweaking shortly after this, and we get another clip of a young Sherlock running on a beach singing an indes in, uh, indecipherable song, and it's the exact same memory that the last time we saw was when Mary drugged him last week, so the big question is, is this something that's happening to him subconsciously, or was this part of Mary's plan? You know, we know Mary has this whole elaborate plan to save John, but we know that there's definitely more than that under the surface because of her whole go-to-hell Sherlock. So there's definitely more going on with that, or is it a Moriarty situation? I mean, we don't really know. Moriarty isn't mentioned a ton in this episode until the very end, but we're definitely going to get into that. But uh, we see this strange, possibly volcanic combo, so that definitely was very interesting to see. And again, they do a really good job with this very subtle imagery throughout the episode. You're not entirely sure what's going on, but again, that's what keeps this show so interesting. And that's why I think a lot of people have kind of gravitated away from this series, because it is quite different. It's a little bit more psychological. There's a lot more going on than just under the surface. And I, I like seeing that. I like that the show is trying to change it up a bit. You know, I like when shows evolve. I like when shows become more confident. And this season to me, that definitely this series especially seems the most confident in terms of storytelling and something that we're definitely getting into that I really did love. Um, but this kind of ends the end of the first act because this episode really, I think more than other episodes, really utilized the three-act structure very well. The first act being Sherlock and, and John kind of torn apart. John going to Mrs. H, who Mrs. H in this episode a lot more than she was in the other, um, in, in the last episode. Miss Hudson has a lot to do here, where she's worried about Sherlock, and she's telling John to get close to him, and how he can't just abandon Sherlock, and things like that. I like the way that she kind of was a voice of reason here, but I also like the way she wasn't a perfect person, but I, I you know, I like that she tried to let her voice be heard. That was definitely well done. Molly still doesn't have a ton to do in this episode. She did have one scene with John and Watson. I mean, John and Sherlock that we'll get into. Um, but like I said, this was pretty much the end of the first act, which I thought was very well done and very well sets up the relation between Faith and Colvich. And you can tell that these two have a very, very uh, significant relationship. This is something where she's kind of terrified of her father. But at the same time, you're kind of on the other side of things where you don't know if throughout the entire episode, if her father really had this plan set in mind or if Sherlock is just on the verge of going completely batshit because he is in fact so infused on drugs. And I thought the way the episode presented that was really well done, a way that other Sherlock episodes haven't really done that. Now, this isn't the first time we've seen Sherlock on drugs, as we know. You know, we've seen him on drugs many times before, and the episode very well makes note of that. Um, but compared to other times, you know, this one is very unknown, you know, what's going to happen there. And the drug trip does seem to help Sherlock's thought process about the task on one hand, 
However, the more he thinks about it, the more he realizes the one word that Culbertson said must have been anyone. In other words, the famous billionaire who's smiling on TV all the time is in fact a serial killer and has to kill people to satisfy his urge. Now, if this is true, or if Sherlock is in fact on drugs, that is the complicated narrative that we deal with throughout this episode. And it's very compelling overall, because you have Sherlock, who's one of the most brilliant men in the world, but the big question is, is he going crazy? As I've said before, I think Moriarty's mission is to break Sherlock, and you definitely get the sense that Sherlock is kind of breaking, and he notes that there's a stereotype of serial killers as eccentric and sloppy and outcast, but that's just the ones we catch after all. So what if he was a rich person with resources and had that same urge to kill? And I thought it was definitely interesting to see, and uh, I, I definitely really did like the way that that was done overall. So I like the way we set up the way that was, uh, that was all done. And then we get a three weeks later time skip. In the middle of the episode, it's very strange the way they did that, but it made sense because we only have three episodes a series, and there's only so much you can do with that, and since every episode is movie length, they are allowed to take certain luxuries that other series wouldn't, so I don't get as pissed when they do these, you know, time skips or things like that, or they do some weird editing errors, I get it, they're meant to be like movies, and this episode definitely took that advantage very, very well, we see there's a three weeks later time skip, we arrive at the beginning of the episode with John and his new therapist rushing outside to find the source of the car chase commotion, and they find none other than Mrs. Hudson climbing out of the bright red sports car. She hands a cell phone from uh, a phone call from Mycroft to the irate cop behind her and asks for John's help with Sherlock. Apparently, he's been high out of his mind running around the apartment quoting Shakespeare, shooting photographs to Culbertson Smith. And she asks John to examine Sherlock as a doctor, which is something that we haven't really touched upon in a while. John is a doctor, as we know. This is someone who, you know, is very smart. He is a doctor, and that's why Sherlock really needs him, because he can get into his head you know, uh, dip, you know, better than any other man or woman can, you know, surely John is the one that can do that, and John reluctantly agrees, you can tell he doesn't really want to, but he kind of wants to help him at the same time, so Mrs. Hudson then opens the trunk of the car, revealing a handcuffed Sherlock, and John asks how she found the therapist's address, she responds that Sherlock gave it to her two weeks ago, and given that John only started seeing this therapist a few days ago, he's understandably irate at uh, Sherlock's constant continuing ability to seemingly predict his every move. So it gets even funnier when John demands Sherlock be medically examined by Molly too, and right on cue, she shows up at the therapist's office, and Sherlock also gave her the address two weeks ago. I love how he just gave everyone the address. You can tell Sherlock is doing everything in his power to try to get everyone back together, and I thought that was pretty funny to see, but Sherlock predictably is not interested in his own health so much as the Culverton Smith case, and that's what's really great about Sherlock here, is because by having this three, you know, this, uh, this three-week time skip, Sherlock has, in fact, be, become very entranced with this case, to the point where he doesn't really care about the fact that he's on drugs. He's clearly is back to the Sherlock that we know. This case has really helped him, but in some ways, it's very much breaking him. We very much see that here. So, he tells him that Culverton Smith is essentially the, mo uh, in quotes, he calls it the most despicable human being he's ever encountered, and it is definitely interesting because, you know, we've dealt with Moriarty and Magnuson, but I think the difference is that he knew what Moriarty and Magnuson were doing. You know, they already had stories. This is just something that he's kind of, you know, um, accused himself of. You know, he's came up with this story for uh, Culverton. He's not exactly sure if it's true. It's kind of something that he's, you know, he has this notion that he is a serial killer and he's not entirely sure. And that's what's so despicable about him is that he doesn't really know if he is a serial killer. He just has this theory in his head that has made him kind of accuse him as a serial killer. I think that definitely is very interesting. And in fact, he's already gone public with the case, we see. Uh, just then, you know, Culverton sends a driver to pick up John and Sherlock to meet him for lunch. And again, I love that this was all Sherlock that did this. Like, you can tell he did everything in his power to make sure that he was right about Culverton. After Molly finishes her examination, declares she's seen corpses held in Sherlock's current state, they meet up with Culverton. We see that Sherlock basically is completely okay and immediately, we see the Colvin seems like the nicest guy. He's smiling them, he's hugging them. In fact, he's already turned into a new commercial for cereal. You know, the serial killer accusation. He's saying that he's a serial killer, literally eating cereal, which was really dumb, but again, it makes sense. Obviously, Colvin's trying to make himself look as good as possible, but again, you just don't trust this guy. Something about him just rubs me the wrong way. He's just rubbing us the wrong way throughout this entire episode, and Toby Jones did a great job 
with not making this character too likable because sure i mean this character has a lot of stuff in this part of the episode that's very likable but at the same time you can definitely tell why sherlock is thinking what he's thinking throughout here because it just is very understandable so he then takes sherlock and john to a hospital he supports and brings them to the children's wing and Sherlock tries to tell some stories of their past adventure to entertain the kids, but he's a terrible storyteller, and they all fizzle apart, and that's why John writes the stories, which again, I like that we get, again saw, that's another reason why John is in Sherlock's life, because he writes these stories for him, and after all, Corvitz him mischievously asked Sherlock how he would catch a serial killer hypothetically and all that, and it predictably creeps everyone out, obviously, because again, Corvitz just seems very creepy, and Culverton offers to take Sherlock and John to his favorite room in the hospital, and I'm like, what could that possibly be? And I'm like, that can't possibly be a good room, and as they speed away, Ghost Mary notes the game is afoot again. John is barely thinking about her, and you can tell it's been a while since he's envisioned her, and... Colerton's favorite room in the hospital turned out to be the mortuary, and after shooting away the medical examiners, he starts an evil-sounding monologue about the college world's fair killer who built an entire murderous hotel to murder and dispose of his victims, and I was really getting creeped out here, I have to say, but again... Toby Jones did such a good job of creeping us out and just showing that something is not right about Culverton. In his opinion, that's way too much effort. Why build his own beach to hide a pebble where he can just find a beach? And John is maybe he's confessing and Culverton laughs at him. And uh, again, you can just tell that there's just something not right. And he hugs Sherlock at their initial meeting. The detective snagged his cell phone. He used it to text Faith to come meet them and finally hear her dad's confession. Because as we know, that's essentially a person who approached Sherlock. However, when she arrived right on cue this is not the woman who visited baker street earlier which this was a very interesting twist because we know that it seemed that faith and sherlock had met that these two had some sort of a relationship and that they talked for a great deal however the second she sees him she doesn't recognize him at all so either that he was under a drug infused hallucination he just pretended that he was talking to faith or he, this is in fact, there's something more going on, and we'll get into that, but this Faith has no memory of meeting Sherlock, and is actually a completely different person, a very well done twist in my opinion, and Sherlock's very confused, and I love the way this episode, like, truly showed you what it means to be on drugs, because I honestly felt like I was on drugs here, I was like, what the hell is going on, and I thought I missed something, I genuinely thought that I missed something here, but I love the way this twist was done. Sherlock's very confused. Once Culverton starts laughing him with that maniacal yellow uh, tooth cackle, he loses it. He grabs a nearby scalpel, lunges at Culverton, only to get beaten down by John, and Sherlock says he deserves it. And this is cut, intercut with uh, the, uh, John and Greg in this interrogation room where Greg is asking John about the scalpel. And they did a very good job of setting that up. You knew that something was going to go down with a scalpel, and... Sherlock eventually says he deserves it because he killed his wife, to which John replies that he did, and at first, I didn't like the way this was done, but they very well fixed this moment uh, very quickly later in the episode, but this was a very intense moment. You can tell this is something that John's wanted to do for Sherlock for a while. It's him finally getting to, uh, you know, actually, it's, it, it's him kind of just adding fuel to the fire. It's showing why John is so against Sherlock. It's showing how he kind of can't give him that normal life that John wants, and unfortunately, whatever Sherlock does, he can't seem to get away from, you know, disaster, and that's something that we definitely see here. So at this point, we kind of think the episode's over, you know, basically they make you think that Sherlock is in fact on drugs, and that he's crazy, and that there's no way that Culverton could be that vindictive. He just seems too nice, but there's just something about him that feels like this is a bit incomplete, and especially once we get to the next scene where we see John is with Greg, and Culverton isn't pressing any charges against Sherlock. Instead, he's giving him top-notch care in the hospital. And I'm like, something is really off about that. Just something about that just doesn't seem right. I get that Culverton's this huge fan of Sherlock, but the fact that he, he wants to take care of him in the hospital just seems very, very creepy. And... John visits Sherlock and leaves his old walking stick from way back in the series premiere, which that was very interesting to see we saw, and also they keep making note notes to uh, Sherlock's hat and how he never wears it, but John is telling him that he should wear it because the kids would love it, and 
On his way out, he gets another call from Mycroft and ends up meeting the older Holmes brother at Baker Street, where government agents are busy coming, uh, combing over Sherlock's Carcosa wall and cleaning up the drug supplies in the kitchen. And once again, John calls out Mycroft for, among other things, being an asshole and lying about the third Holmes brother because he knows there's more going on. And Miss Hudson also has a ton of shit to say about Mycroft, how she doesn't like the way he doesn't protect his brother and how he's just an asshole and things like that. And I love the way she just made her opinion known. Really funny moments from Mrs. Hudson in this episode. She really made a lot of it for me and uh, I really did love seeing what they did with Mrs. Hudson, her defending her fancy car to John, things like that, her saying that she's not her, his housekeeper, uh, just one of the funniest episodes for her by far. But what I also love is that they really show why she's entitled, you know, she defended herself, she showed her points and... While it was funny, it was one of those instances where you could really side with her here. And they did a really good job with that with Mrs. Hudson. I feel it's a character that's most times just kind of used to be there for silly moments. And they really used her in a good uh, in a good way this time. I really did like that. And uh, basically, she says that Sherlock's not all about thinking and rationality. He gets emotional. He lashes out. He shoots the wall. And when he can't figure something out, he stabs it. And that very much is true. And I do agree with what she has to say there, that that's not who Sherlock is, that he does, in fact, have problems. You know, he's not this perfect person. He may seem perfect, and he may seem like a genius, but like everyone, he does, in fact, crack. And that's something that people think he can't do. And Mycroft, especially his brother, should know this. And I can totally understand why Mrs. Hudson is thinking that. And John's eyes fall to the most recently stabbed thing in the apartment. Mary's miss me message, and Miss Hudson demands the government spooks leave her so her friend can watch a video from his departed wife, and she says the best for Mycroft saying get out of her house, and we now see Mary's message in full. You know, we only saw part of it last week, but we get to see the whole thing, and that go to hell Sherlock from the end of last week finally makes sense. We know she told him to save John, but the only way to do that was to get John to save him, we realize. So now we realize that there really was no other way for Sherlock to save John. John has to save Sherlock from something, and she told Sherlock Sherlock to pick a fight with a bad guy and put himself through hell, so he really would need John to save him. And I like the way the episode was very unpredictable here. You know, they made you think that John was going to be the one attacked by Culverton, when in reality it was actually John that needed to save Sherlock. And we see immediately Sherlock could really use some help. Culverton slid into his room. He explains he not only paid for this whole wing of the hospital, he kept firing the architect so no other person would know the entire layout. And again, very, very creepy, honestly. Just something about him you can tell. He is ready to just fucking kill him, honestly, you can just tell him, Sherlock actually asked Culverton to kill him, and the villain seems to take visceral, almost sexual pleasure immediately, like, he wants to kill him, he, there's nothing more that he wants than to kill someone, not just Sherlock, but anyone, I mean, this is a man that just loves to kill, you can definitely tell, when he said, I want to kill someone, he genuinely meant, I want to kill anyone, I don't care who it is, I just love to kill, I just love seeing people die, it's, it's disgusting, and it's sick as hell, but, it makes, you know, it really does go with Sherlock's induced vision. It shows it wasn't just a vision, and there turns out not to be enough to satisfy Culverton, however. He soon starts suffocating Sherlock. You know, we see he dials it up. I thought he was just going to kill him by that way, but he literally starts suffocating Sherlock, at which point John bursts in to stop him, and... Uh, that was a really great scene where he stopped him. I did like the way that John saved him in the end. And Sherlock, we then think is really badass scene where Sherlock reveals that Ivy was actually just Celine. He was only doing it to final get Sh Culverton to confess. And Culverton still thinks he's won, having previously removed a recording device from Sherlock's clothing. But Sherlock reveals the final one in the head of John's walking stick. And just such a genius move. I really did love seeing that. And the bad guy's been caught. Sherlock and John are working together again. And it's a really uh, satisfying scene. Even though it was one episode, like I said, these are done like movies. So it's kind of like if you were to do one movie a year. One with Sherlock and John not being as close and them getting back together. I can really believe it. You, know, you can see why Sherlock and John uh, were meant to get together. You got the sense that Mary kind of did this to bring them back together, and I really did love seeing that, and Sherlock and John are clearly still kind of awkward. John wants to get out as soon as possible. He and Molly and Mrs. Hudson are taking shifts, making sure that Sherlock stays clean, but he stops when he hears Sherlock get a test message from none other than Irene Adler, and John tells Sherlock to take advantage of a woman liking him while he can still, while he still can, because the opportunity vanishes before he knows it, and of course, he's talking about Mary, and 
I love this scene where John actually admits that he did in fact cheat on Mary because it didn't seem like we were talking about that girl, but no, he did cheat on her with that woman on the on the uh, on the bench from last week. Although he confirms it never went farther than texting, and after some crying, he and Sherlock hug it out. It's a very satisfying scene. I really did love that scene overall with them hugging it out and. Basically just them confessing everything, you know, Sherlock admits what he did was wrong, and John finally admits to Sherlock that he didn't kill Mary, that she did in fact save him, and that he just, you know, kind of got mad at Sherlock for doing what he did, and Sherlock understands why, and I just really love that they understood each other, I love that they finally came to that understanding, and the pain of Mary's death is never going to get away from them, but I do like the way they are starting to move on from it. But then we get to the ending here, which the ending is truly one of the most shocking, uh, insane endings we've had from this show and let's just get into it because I have no idea where this is gonna go so we see John talking to his new therapist but this is where things get really weird you know it seems like it's just a normal conversation but the therapist starts asking John very weird questions like if he ever got an answer about the third home sibling so why would she ask him this because she didn't he didn't really bring it up specifically why would she randomly ask him this but John's convinced he never mentioned it to her so maybe Sherlock told her after all they did spend a night together as we know so we know there's definitely something off about that and we realized very quickly she in fact is the fake faith this is the faith that Sherlock was talking to he's not crazy he was talking to her and that's not all she quickly pulls her hair back and reveals the plastic flower that John had been wearing on the bus she's also the woman he had his affair with so this is clearly a master disguise and that's still not the end because when John asks for her name she reveals she's called euros after the east wing yes euros no not not the money that you buy in Europe. Euro, strange name, but her parents did love weird names like that. Sherlock, for instance, in Mycroft, while she appears to shoot John at point-blank range, Sherlock recovers the note she gave him his faith, finds a secret ultraviolet message that says, Miss Me, and we realize that this is, in fact, Sherlock's sister. She shoots John, and that is how the episode ends. Crazy stuff overall, a lot of stuff to process, so let's get into this episode and where I think we're going to go next week, because I really have no idea whatsoever. So holy shit, one episode this was. I mean, there really is so much to get through in this episode. Uh, first of all, the fact that now we now know about Sherlock's sister, the way that we're building that up, this has been something that we've been building up for a while now. I think ever since it was series, it was one episode in series three where Mycroft alluded to another one, and for the longest time, everyone thought that it was going to be Moriarty. The Moriarty was maybe a half sibling or something like that, but that's clearly not the case. This is in fact um, Euros, who is that sister, and I like that it's a sister and not a brother. It's just a really interesting twist that I really didn't think of, and I also love the way that she played both John and Sherlock. She played them both like a fiddle, and you can kind of tell by the way that she was with John and with Sherlock. You know, with John, she was this woman who gave him everything he wanted, you know, this simple life. She was very simple. She was there for him. She provided for him. She gave him her, his, you know, her number and everything. This really was the dream woman for John. This was his escape from reality. This was his way to finally have a normal life and settle down and not to deal with all the shit going down his life. And then with Sherlock, this was a woman who was there to get him back on track, to get him back to focusing on a killer and focusing on what he does best in solving crimes. But you can tell, again, she's there to break him. She's there to make some sort of inciting incident occur. And I'm willing to bet that the whole Moriarty thing isn't really Moriarty. I think Sherlock is thinking that because Moriarty is the one who would always say, miss me. I think that Euros has been up to it all along. I think she's trying to trick Sherlock into thinking that Moriarty's alive, when in reality it's just Euros having this huge plan to make him go, you know, to break Sherlock, so that way he can't save John in the end of it, and I think that's the real plan of all this, and I think that definitely is going to be very interesting to see how that is all unveiled. Now, I could be completely wrong. There have been many theories that her and Moriarty are working together. Maybe she knows Moriarty post hummus Lee or something like that. Moriarty is definitely dead. I said this feeling that Moriarty is very dead and either she's living his legacy or somehow she knows him. I honestly don't really know, but this is definitely very much connected to Moriarty. I mean, this has to be connected to last week. And something I loved is that most of these uh, penultimate episodes usually are completely unrelated to the main narrative. You know, in series three was about John and Mary's wedding. I didn't watch the other series, but I heard they were completely unrelated to what was going on. So I was surprised this episode was so focused on getting to next week's episode. It's probably the most story-driven series that we've had. I was very happy to see that with this series. Definitely, I've really enjoyed that so far. The other big question of all this is, what is really going to happen with Moriarty? Because we know that Moriarty's out there. How is that all going to play out? That's going to be very interesting. And, uh... <sighs> 
The other big thing, of course, is how does Mycroft fit into all this? Because we did hear Mycroft, he got a call, you know, it said, uh, call, um, what was it? Let me get, let me get back to it. I don't remember what it was. Oh, uh, let me get back to it. Shit. Oh, call Sharonford. Okay, yeah, yeah. He got a call that said call Sharonford. The question is, is this a place that possibly Euros wants to meet up at? And then she's going to see that Euros is still alive. Does he know about Euros? Why doesn't Sherlock know about her? I mean, he's never talked about her. So either this is sibling that they don't talk about because she's very evil and they don't want anything to do with her. Or they just didn't know about her. And I'm willing to bet that it might be the second one. That maybe they didn't know about her or something like that. Maybe she was just estranged. But she definitely is a personal vendetta against Sherlock for some reason. We don't really know what that's about. But Mycroft knows about her and Sherlock doesn't. And I find that to be very interesting, the fact that Mycroft doesn't know. So we'll have to see. Mary's whole plan is very elaborate, but it makes a lot of sense. She was clearly there to bring John and Sherlock back together. But was she in on what Euros was doing? I'm not entirely sure. I think that definitely could be a possibility too. We'll have to see. But again, guys, Sherlock is a show that's just so expertly crafted and so confusing. I love the way they just threw a million things in our faces in this last episode where literally anything could happen, honestly. A lot of people are thinking that next week's episode, the final problem, is the final problem. Like, this may be it for Sherlock. And honestly, I could see that being a possibility. You know, Martin Freed and Benedict Cumberbatch are already as busy as they are. I don't know if they would do another series. Honestly, this very much seems like the end game to me. It seems like we're getting to those final revelations. It seems like we're getting to that final... Uh, that final problem, and I think the final problem could very well be the final outing for this show, but again, I'm not entirely sure. But what an incredible episode this was between the drama, the suspense, uh, the intrigue of it all, and of course, Culverton Smith. Toby Jones was so great in this role. I really do love this episode overall, and I am definitely going to give Sherlock Series 4, Episode 2, The Lying Detective, a 5 out of 5 or an A+. Plus. Guys, this is one of the best episodes of the show so far. It was suspenseful. It was surprising. I had no idea what's going to happen. I really have no idea where we're going to go next week. One of the best episodes I've seen of this series so far. If you guys didn't love last week, you will definitely get back on board this week. I think this is more back to what Sherlock should be. But what I love about it is that while it did have a great case going on, it also did a great job in setting up, you know, next week's episode with this incredible revelation that really could go anywhere that I really have no idea where it's going to go. And that makes it that much more intriguing. It makes the episode that much more impressive by how shocking that revelation really was.